Best Available Podcast, episode 42. A lot of fun stuff to talk about in this episode. We had a really fun weekend, PGA Championship. Stanley Cup playoffs are going on right now. A few of the series are actually over, so we can talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about motorsports. Just a lot of stuff that we're going to try to hit on today in episode 42. May 25th, almost done the month of May. Matt, how are you feeling? Seems like things are kind of starting to trend a little back to normal. We kind of saw that, especially with sports this week at the PGA, especially at Madison Square Garden. That was a cool scene. So, Matt, how, how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. You know, Memorial Day, we're kicking off summer this weekend. Uh, you mentioned everything starting to go back to normal or feel normal. Uh, listen, we've almost made it, right? You know, got our vaccines. We're doing our part. Sports are starting to look like sports again. You know, we're starting to get crowds again. Um, the official start of summer, uh, as our, you know, as someone who are you are feuding with right now in our group chat would say, it's the summer of blank. Uh, so it's the summer of us. You know, summer. I know you and uh, Mister Denigris are feuding uh, at the mini golf uh, course right now. So we won't bring that beef up, but it's the summer of everyone getting back to normal. Uh, so Memorial Day weekend, big weekend, one of my favorites of the year. So, yeah. Well, let's talk about, you brought up mini golf. I want to start with the PGA Championship just because it was such a thrilling thing to follow, really for all four days, but especially on Saturday and Sunday, and I guess really Sunday uh, was just it's so unexpected just because if Phil wasn't in contention uh, it, people still would have watched it but it would have lost a lot of its a lot of the glamour but this 50 year old guy that had struggled so much recently uh, he was just on the champions tour and he won there but he went into the weekend with really long odds by the way Phil Mickelson his name did come up when we were talking about our picks last week so we were correct so we're going to pat ourselves on the back for that one so we got the winner correct this time around. We also said Brooks Kepka, so we got the top two, which was good. I think we said Louis Oosties, and I think we threw his name in there. So really, we got all the contenders. But it was just so exciting watching Phil try to battle Father Time, battle the young guns behind him. It started off a little rough, of course. He starts off with the bogey on one. You're like, oh, here we go. Here's the good Phil Mickelson experience that he battles back on two, gets another bogey three. He chips out of that, or not chips out, but he hits the ball out of the bunker on hole number five. That's when the tide started to turn. It was just that you can have your own opinions on whether the crowd should have been as big as it was. Everybody's standing next to each other, but it made the moment feel like it should. Like last year when there were no crowds, you know, we all kind of made the point like, ah, at least sports are back. But the crowd really made Sunday feel like it was a major event and that, you know, these players were really battling for something. It was just so thrilling to just, as soon as Phil makes contact with the ball, you hear all the cheer and this and that. That shot of him walking up to 18 and this entire group of people just right behind him was almost like, it was almost like a Renaissance art piece, I felt like, just like the still shot of that. So it was exciting. Of course, Phil won. But Matt, I think to, to date, that was one of the most exciting sporting events we've seen in 2021. Yeah, it, this is bringing memories back of when we were in our senior year of college, Ryan. It was right before the Con Banquet and Tiger Woods won the Masters, right? How amped up we all were. And I don't know if it was you or Glenn or somebody was on the air during the broadcast and we were providing Tiger updates the whole weekend back in the studio. Uh, it's It feels like the same thing, right? I mean, these guys that were staples when we were younger and have kind of tampered off uh, just because of age but are able to win at the highest level still, it's really impressive. And... I got to catch a little bit more of Sunday than some of the other days. Uh, for me, it was more Thursday and Sunday where I got to watch more of this. Um, and yeah, it, the, the crowd made it feel a lot more. I mean, obviously, we're going to still have to get used to seeing images like that after the traumatic year that everyone's been through, right? I mean, crowd that's just going to be a part of it. Um, but at the end of the day, it was really cool to see a guy who is a legend winning at the highest level 
at 50, right, or 51, it's crazy, right? He could be our dad. That's, like, that could be, that's, like, pretty impressive to go and win at the highest level against really, really quality players. Um, and, and, you know, golf, I think it shows more than anything else that you could be any age in golf and play at a high level, which it, you can't say that about a lot of other sports. No, I think it should, it's, especially nowadays, I think it's so difficult. All these young guys, it just they, they, not that the young guys back in our time weren't talented, but like you really have to be on top of your game, especially at 50 years of age on a course as tough as the ocean course down there in South Carolina. It was, it was a th- just so incredibly exciting to see Phil just turn the clock back for one weekend. So, so nobody would have expected this guy to do what he did. It's been what, like seven or eight years since the last time he won a major championship at 50 years old, the oldest guy ever to win a major. It It's just the, the storyline was great. I enjoyed reading afterwards how he kind of uh, building up to this, you know, he wasn't playing well. He kind of realized that his mind wasn't where it needed to be when he was playing golf. So he challenged himself to play as much golf a day as he possibly could. He was playing like 36 holes a day, which is really, just, I, I, I can't even imagine doing that, but it, it seemed like it worked for him. Uh, it seems like he's on a different nutritional plan, which has worked for him, a different workout plan, which has worked. And and now, of course, he's going to be uh, exempt from the U.S. Open for the next five seasons, five years, I should say, which is good for him. The one major he hasn't won yet, it's, it's kind of hard to say that, hey, he this is his time. But, you know, nobody expected him to do this, so maybe he'll go into the U.S. Open with a lot of momentum, finally get that final major that he needs to complete all of them and – Either way, though, it was great. Uh, I think Sunday was kind of cool, too, just to show how difficult golf really is. I mean, Brooks Kepka, he's coming back from the knee injury. He's clearly not at 100%, but just a guy that's always in contention. But Sunday, it just it wasn't work for him, especially on the putting green. He had said that it was hard to get the right line with the wind and everything, but it just goes to show golf is so difficult, even if you're an elite golfer. If it's not your day, it's just not your day, and Sunday just – Things were not going right for Brooks. He was in contention all day, but it just, it didn't feel like it. Yeah, Zach Casenza, golf is hard, and it is a sport. So we just have to, again, clarify this because we're going to get this text message in about a couple hours, Ryan. Um, it's really impressive. Having Jim Nance on the call as well, it's just like, it's like the bingo card, right? You're checking off Phil at a major, you know, Brooks in contention, you know, CBS theme song, right, for golf. Jim Nance on the call. We're just hitting that. Crowds are back. That was bingo right there. Right? I just named five things, right? So there you go. Um, it's it's really, especially now that I think you and I are both appreciating golf more in our post-college years. You're probably more of a golf guy back in college, but it's really hard. And you got to appreciate when you see moments like this because people like to make fun of golf and say, oh, it's easy. It's not that hard. But you, you got to go out there and and play it and you'll realize how hard this this sport is. I want to give a shout out to my guy, Ricky Fowler. He has struggled so much for uh, for a while now, but he came in strong with a one under in the opening round. If it wasn't for the second round, he really probably would have been in contention on Sunday, but he shot a four over 76 on on Friday that kind of put him out of it. But overall, his Saturday and Sunday, he went 69 on Saturday. He went 71 on Sunday. He finished one under for the entire weekend, finished tied for eighth. A lot of guys were tied for eighth. I think five through 16 were all one under. So this was this is what I was waiting for. I think I was reading about Ricky, and hopefully this is kind of the 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 return that he needed, the momentum that he needs to kind of get it going. I mean, people forget we talk about golf being such a difficult sport. That's why Tiger transcended. Uh, he was such a transcendent guy. These other guys, it's not uncommon to see them go one to two years without winning anything. One to two years where they struggle. I mean, we saw Rory go through, we saw Spieth go through it, we see Ricky go through it. These guys are really talented better than 99% of anybody that's ever played golf, but they they still struggle. But I hope, that from a golf perspective, I'm biased. But I think when Ricky's good, the sport just is that much better because he has such a devoted fan base of really younger people 
mainly. So I hope that this is what he needs to kind of get back into things and be a contender again. Because it was fun seeing him play well this weekend. Well, as someone who has been the day one Ricky Fowler supporter, Ryan, I'm happy for you to see him, you know, hopefully try and turn things around. Uh, I know you have been big on him since high school. It, listen, golf is a sport that everyone needs to watch. Golf is back. I'm declaring it. Uh, this is exciting stuff. Um, you know, we said it was speed to um, just how difficult it is to come back, as you said. And you you kind of, it, it's just it, almost cyclical, right, Ryan? You know, go through this cycle of, you know, guys being up, guys being down. Um, I think maybe Ricky Fowler might be the next one, Ryan. But he had didn't he have to get a special exception to be in this, or was this a different tournament? I think this was different. I don't think he needed exemption for this, but uh, people will remember we talked about it. He didn't qualify for the Masters. Like that was he was. I hate that I'm going to say this. He was down bad. You know, he, he was struggling out there. But it's. Now, I hopefully this is what he needs to, to get moving forward. I will say, I want to bring this up before I forget, the second biggest story out of the weekend, out of the PGA Championship weekend, wasn't the fact that we saw Ustazen have an incredible run where he's in contention on Sunday, not where we saw the two Irish guys in Shane Lowry and Patrick Harrington finish top five, not Harry Higgs having a great run of it. It was afterwards in an interview Brooks Kepka did with NBC Golf in which he was standing outside the clubhouse and he was answering a question. That's where he kind of said that he couldn't really get a line on the putts. And then everybody's favorite guy to hate in golf, Bryson DeChambeau, walks behind him and the clickety-clackety metal spikes. And you see Bryson just close his eyes. You could tell he gets really pissed off. I, reportedly, Bryson said something something under his breath. I don't know if that's true. I have no way of knowing if it is or not. Still, this... I get, I've said before, I get why everybody hates Bryson, but this is what golf needs. They need a good villain. They need a polarizing figure. So whatever your feeling is on Bryson, positive, negative, I love it. I love Bryson's reaction, or not Bryson, I love Brooks's reaction to just Bryson walking behind him. I think that's what the sport needs. I think stuff like this, it's fine. It's perfect. He's not a villain, Ryan. He's just an annoying guy. I mean, I've said this before, and he really became annoying right after golf made its return last year during the summer. You know, he's complaining about cameramen being too close, complaining about ants being on the green. It, like, listen, I am I'm a huge Brooks Kepka guy, have been for a while. I think Bryson's just annoying. Yeah, you're right. Golf needs uh, every sport needs an annoying guy uh, or someone to hate. You know, we'll talk about the NHL. The hateable guy there is Tom Wilson. Uh, there's there's always a guy that you need there uh, to be polarizing. Um, so, yeah, it, it was funny to see because I think he embodies what a lot of golf fans feel about Bryson. So, very relatable moment there for Brooks Koepka. It was it was great too. Afterwards, Bryson posted an Instagram story of him doing. I don't know really what. I mean, I'm not a weightlifting expert, but I don't know what he was really trying to do in his his Instagram story. It seemed like he just wanted to pick up some dumbbells and do like an ego lift. Like, oh, look how much I can lift up. Uh, but this is as as we kind of both alluded to. Sports are better when they have a guy like this. Like as you said, with hockey, it's Tom Wilson and. I think you can throw Brad Marchand in there. NASCAR, you got Kyle Busch and Joey Logano. Baseball, right now, it's probably Tony La Russa is that guy that everybody loves to hate. So sports are better when there's guys like this. Everyone says that when everybody gets along well, things kind of get boring. So when you have a guy like this who can kind of drum up some controversy, even unintentionally, I think it's great. But that was the PGA Championship. Got the U.S. Open coming up next month, which will be a lot of fun. We'll see if Phil can complete get that final diamond in his crown that he needs. Um, so there's going to be a lot of intrigue there for sure. We mentioned hockey, so let's jump into hockey. Actually, I I meant to do this at the start. I completely forgot. I'm going to try to do one of the greatest feats of mankind, which is sh give a Lego update. The build is done of the White House. So this is like a three-piece puzzle that already came undone. We're going to battle through it here. 
Gonna try our best to not have this stuff break. Hold on. Can you detach it and just show it in sections? I, you know, I, that's not what the people want. The people want the full thing. So I'm gonna try my best here. We're gonna try to lift it this way. Maybe this will be better. We're gonna All try right, to so get as Ryan's hand. doing this. Here we go. Okay. I, I, he built the White House. Uh, there it is. There you go, Ryan. We're, okay, right there. There it is. Oh! So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, oh. <laughs> That was just the roof. That's fine. That's easy to. That's easy. Okay, we're not. Okay. Up, uh, Ryan. Up. Uh, we're doing all you right. See, I told you, just do it in sections. Did it fall on your lap or did it fall on the ground? Well, it's good. The pieces that came off, it's just, that's like, like the windows, which is easy to put back. So we're fine. We're doing all right. Uh, see, that was the White House. Very patriotic set from Ryan that he built. Uh, his first Lego set in a long time. Over a thousand pieces. I could give you the exact piece count as Ryan's reconstructing his White House right now. Uh, I'm going to go on Lego.com. This is great podcasting by us. Um, I don't even know what it would be under here. Let me search. Great content. Ryan's reconstructing the White House. The piece count comes out to 1,483. So a big set for Ryan to start out his Lego building. Uh, you right there. I was trying to figure out where these things go, and I think I. That goes there. Yeah, hey, there we go. All right. Yeah, you got it. I'm looking at the set right now on the website, so you, you got a. I'm surprised they didn't have something to connect it in the middle. Um, they have these little Technic pieces that you can have to where they'll lock in all three. I'm surprised that's not what they did for the set. So I got a set of windows here that I'm trying to figure out where they go. I'm I'm kind of lost at this point. This is just this is probably one of the best things we've done in the history of this podcast. Me trying to figure out where this one piece. Oh, there it is. That's where it goes. Okay. But see, in the picture here, they have this this person holding it up, Ryan. Like, uh, and she and she's holding it up from just one side of it. So I'm surprised. Yeah, I don't that, know uh, how she's accomplishing that. It that it's not that easy. I can tell you she, from experience. She's got the whole thing. I'm looking at it right now. She's yeah. I don't know if they use moving. like some super glue or something, but it that it ain't that easy. I can tell you. Oh, I see how they. they I'm really surprised they didn't have it connect like that. That's, come on, Lego. Ugh. I go connect that piece. And then we do this. We got the ice cream man outside the ice cream truck. I don't know if that picks up on my mic. Just, just great middle of the show banter right here. Well, this is what Ryan the people want. Legos. There we go. So now we're all connected again. There um, you go. Yeah, I'm really surprised they didn't build that a certain way, Ryan. Where they have like these little. I guess be the best way to describe for people who don't know Legos, it's like these little tube pieces that will connect and kind of lock things into place. Um, so it's not like a traditional brick. I'm really surprised they didn't use that for that. Yeah, you and me both. Okay, so that's all good now. Um, the next thing I have on the list, I don't know when I'm going to build it, is the town center. So that's next. I still have to figure out what I where I'm going to put the White House. It's to, next to me right now, like on my desk. I don't want to keep it there because it's taking up some space. But that's the next order of business. But anyway, huh, that was fun. Okay, let's get into something probably not as fun as what we just went through, what I just experienced. Uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, three of the series are over. Last week when we talked about it, um, we said that maybe a couple of them would be over, and they are. We had two sweeps. We also had a gentleman sweep. Uh, we'll start over in the. Uh, let me. I want to get these, these, uh, these plugs in here first, actually. So give me, give me a second here. Um, the Mass Mutual East, Scotiabank North. There we go. I need what? The what was Honda the, West. The Honda West. That's what I need. We're gonna start with the Honda West, where we had a sweep. Um, it was Colorado and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this just because, well, actually, I don't know if you had seen on Instagram, but, uh, it seemed like Jordan Bennington had picked up, uh, some detractors, uh, on Colorado. There were several avalanche players who posted pictures kind of going at Jordan Bennington, which I thought was kind of funny. 
but Matt, this this uh, this series was not even close, uh, like at all. So it, uh, as I said, as we said last week, Colorado was clearly the best team on paper going into the playoffs, and they proved it. They won the games four to one, six to three, five to one, five to two. St. Louis was never really in the series, so Colorado did what they needed to do, and they. They're my Stanley Cup pick right now. I know I'm going out on a limb, really making a risky pick here, but it's just hard for me to see anybody beating Colorado. They are just, from top to bottom everywhere, they are so talented. Yeah, so the the people, the fans deserve a Tampa Bay-Colorado Stanley Cup final, um, which would be just insane. Um, as a Bruins fan, it wouldn't be insane because they wouldn't be in the final, but... It's almost like Tory Krug should have stayed with Boston instead of went to St. Louis. Uh, shout out to the St. Louis Blues, Tory Krug, for that. I'm not a fan of Jordan, ben- Jordan Bennington either, Ryan, because he prevented me from my second Stanley Cup of my lifetime. Uh, so shout out to him. Colorado's just better. We've talked about it last year when they were in the bubble. This year, I, they they, they got to do something. It, it, it's, you know been too long for this franchise you know pretty solid hockey hockey community out there as well um they're really exciting they're able to score a lot um yeah they're just really entertaining Uh, and and they're worth staying up for not all hockey games ryan during the Stanley cup playoffs i don't think are worth staying up till one or two in the morning like the edmonton winnipeg triple overtime game last night i stayed up for and i really regretted it um this Colorado team is worth, you know, just mortgaging your entire night for. I agree. It's this. I talked about last week how, like, Carolina, they were, like, a great example of a playoff hockey team. Colorado, really, is you just see the talent just shine everywhere on the ice, on the offensive end, the defensive side, the goalies. It's just they're they're the best. They, were, they won the President's Trophy for a reason. So I, I hope for hockey's sake that they can get through to the finals uh, Colorado in the finals would be great as you said so hopefully they can pull it off they're going to play the winner uh, of the Minnesota Vegas series a series that I listen I, I I might have displayed or downplayed the wild a little bit the wild won game one Vegas looked like they were ready for the gentleman sweep but Minnesota came firing back yesterday and they won 4-2 they got game six in Minnesota tomorrow uh, Wednesday, May 26th. So we'll see if Minnesota can force a game seven. I said that Colorado Vegas should have been the Western Conference Finals. Of course, it won't be that this year. It's only going to be a semifinal matchup, but I think Vegas should be scared. Uh, Minnesota, they are, they're a lot better than people give them credit for. They're a lot better than I give them credit for. I'll call myself out there. That was a fun game last night. Uh, and I mean, I talked about last week how Minnesota has a lot of fun players. I thought Vegas on paper was the one of the top three most talented teams coming into the playoffs, but I think there's a very real chance they could get eliminated here if they're not careful. Yeah, I, I think one of the big reasons why Minnesota has stayed in it is the way Camp Talbot has played, right? I mean, he's made a lot of really good saves against a team in Vegas that we talked about with Colorado, can put the puck in the back of the net. Um, Minnesota's always a feisty team in the playoffs. There's always a couple. I mean, remember, Ryan, the Blues were like that for a while, too. And Nashville, a team, teams that could, you know, sneak a series, you know, push you to game seven. They might not always win or be the better team, but there are certain teams in hockey that have just always been like that. Uh, you know, if you look for basketball, the Pacers used to be that team as well. Um, I think there's two quality teams here, but... Again, you mentioned it. We're waiting for a Vegas-Colorado matchup. Two really good environments as well. Obviously, you know, Vegas opening up a little bit. Really good crowd there. Colorado really loud there as well. Uh, So it'll look and sound really good on TV. And there'll be a lot of really good quality on the ice. But I I wouldn't be too worried. You know, when you're up 3-1, Ryan, I'm... I'm not, I'm not as concerned as some other people would be in any sport, really. You know, the the blow 3-1 lead thing doesn't happen as much as people, you know, think it does. So I'm fine with Vegas. 
It, it does not happen. It, there's been some famous 3-1 leads blown, but uh, yeah, I'm not as concerned. It's most dangerous lead, man. If you're you, you're down 3-1, if you win game five, then you come back home for game six. You win game six, then it's winner take all. I'm excited to see. It's I, very I, difficult to lose three consecutive games unless you're just, like, as a playoff team. So it's different if you're just, like, a bad regular season team and you lose three in a row. But it is difficult to lose three consecutive games of playoff intensity, in my opinion, at least. It's It's very difficult to do that. It's even more difficult to lose four in a row, but I mean, I can't imagine a team that would have done that oh, yeah, in the playoffs. Know, I'll, so we're going to go to the Scotia. Three zero, and yeah, and this, look that up. Twenty ten Flyers Bruins. For any of the our younger audience out there, uh, that was that was not a fun year for me. Well, listen, so. y'all y'all got payback the next year by sweeping us out of the playoffs, so it worked out. Um, and we won a cup. So Scotia Bank North. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we're going to start the Winnipeg series, Winnipeg. It's, I don't even want to say they dismantled the Oilers. I mean, the final three games of the series went to overtime. Uh, the final game yesterday, as you said, went three overtimes, but it's, I, I feel bad because I made the point of, Hey guys, listen, if you really want to watch playoff hockey, go watch the Oilers. You'll see Connor McDavid at his best. He got held off the score sheet the first two games and then his team gets swept one of two teams that got swept here in the playoffs. Uh, I feel very bad for McDavid. I had said something in our group chat last night that I, I kind of actually think I'm going to walk back. You had brought it up. Uh, it's been a pretty popular comparison that McDavid is be, is like the Mike Trout of his sport, and that's true. I had said, unlike Trout, McDavid will actually voice his displeasure I'm going to walk that back. I, I don't know. I feel like he won't. I don't think he's like a Jack Eichel that will voice his displeasure publicly. I hope that he will because he deserves to be on a team that can get deep into the playoffs. It's You'd think a team with two of the top five players in hockey, they would be able to make deep runs consistently. But like this is embarrassing if you're Edmonton. You're the number two seed. Like Winnipeg's a good team in and of their own right. They have a lot of fun players. They have Nikolai Ehlers. You still have Connor Hellebuck there. You have a lot of good guys. Uh, Kyle Connor, but to get swept in the first round by the Winnipeg Jets, like th- to not even win one game, that's pretty embarrassing. I feel like I know the ca- you know the Canadian teams are always competitive, but you can't get swept like that. You, that's that's not acceptable. Well, I think what makes it you know even worse is the fact that this this division isn't playing with fans, right? Because it's in Canada, so the atmosphere is just different. If you're looking on TV and you're seeing like. Carolina and Nashville, every game's a sellout, and then you're playing in an empty arena, you know, it could affect your mind a little bit. But at the same time, to to have a almost neutral atmosphere like that, and as you said, have Dreisaitl, have McDavid, you know, two of the top five players in the league, and not to mention, if, if you just look back on their history, Ryan, I mean, there was a streak where they had a bunch of number one picks, right? Or at least in the top three. I mean, you go with Nugent Hopkins, Taylor Hall, McDavid, I might be missing a guy or two in there, but it's it's really kind of frustrating because this used to be a premier franchise in the league. I mean, granted, that was because of one ma- one man, but at the same time, it's frustrating because I love Connor McDavid. As I said last week, I have his jersey. Um, you got to get this man out of Edmonton. Clearly, it's not his fault. It's not Dreisaitl's fault. It's the fact that they don't have a team beneath them. And I saw that from a lot of, you know, Edmonton fans on Twitter last night. It's it's frustrating. It really is. Because hockey's best player, Ryan, just got swept. And, and we talk about marketing, and we talked about it with baseball for a while, too, of getting your stars deeper into the playoffs and trying to structure it that way. People were talking about how easy this division would have been, right? I mean, some of the weaker teams and the ability to make a deeper run, right, to be, to, to be able to get a team like Toronto into the Final Four or a team like Edmonton into the Final Four. And it's it's that is going to be one of the biggest things we'll look back on is the fact that they could not get Connor McDavid out of the first round in a path that was a little bit easier than past years. You you brought up the draft pick thing for Edmonton. 
I love bringing that up just because I think it's so fascinating that they had so many opportunities to add talent and they just they they didn't. So I want to go from 2007 to 2016, a span of 10 years, because I think that that, number one, it's a nice round number. Number two, by 2016, if you're drafted in 2016, by 2021, I'd like to think that everybody from that time stand could contribute. So they went, just the number, the, the overall pick, they went 6, 22, 10, 1, 1, 1, 7, 3, 1, 4, 22, and that was that. So I think I accidentally added a year there at the end in 2017. But with all those picks, you you just you get Sam Gagne, who didn't he certainly was not a sixth overall pick type of guy. Jordan Eberle, who it, to his credit he performed pretty well for his 22nd overall pick. Magnus P- Payarvi, who didn't really turn out to be great. Taylor Hall, who's no longer on the team. Nugent Hopkins still on the team. Yakupov complete bust. Darnell Nurse. Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, Jesse Pugliarvi, who to this point has not been very good. You would think picking that high up for 10 straight years, you would get some type of core together. It just didn't work. And I get that the draft is so hard to do. you got to evaluate players correctly. I get it. Some guys just bust no matter what you do. But that's just, I feel that's that's pretty embarrassing to pick up that high for 10 years in a row. And, and this is what it is, a team that can't make deep runs. It's... It, as I said, it, I think it's it's fascinating to me. Yeah, it, it's so the best, best comparison that I can draw here is when the Cavaliers had a bunch of top picks, right? And they ended up turning that into a title, right? I mean, obviously you bring in LeBron James and that kind of moved things along a little quicker, but that was talked about for a while too of how they had a bunch of picks, but they were able to turn it into a title. And you look at Edmonton and it's, it's just sad, right? I mean, you have the best player in my opinion in hockey and he's just sitting there in, he's buried in like the nine, 10 o'clock time slot for a team that, you know, has not made it out of the first round and, you know, who knows how long. I'll even go as far to say past the second round, really, since Gretzky was there. So, it's just, you know, it's sad. Because it, it, they, they are the prime example of that. Because at least the Cavaliers turned it around and won a title. And they can look back on that and say, hey, we have this title. You know, Cleveland, this is for you. LeBron, you know. Edmonton, we've been waiting for 20 years. The Avalanche are a perfect example. I know everything's so different. Everything is not linear. But they took Nathan McKinnon number one overall in 2013. They're a perfect example of an organization that surrounded their young stud with the talent that they need to make a deep run. And that we're, we're seeing it now. They're clearly the best team, on paper at least, in the National Hockey League. And yet they did not pick up – they were not in the top – I'll, they did not get as many top picks as Edmonton did over the course of... I mean, you figure they picked McKinnon in 2013, so they they didn't have as many opportunities as Edmonton to add talent to this core, and yet they were still able to do it. And that's... I, I know it's easier said than done. I know it's easy for us to kind of sit here in our computer chairs in front of a microphone and say, oh, they should have done this, they should have done that, but you're going to risk losing this guy, I feel like, if you don't make changes quickly i mean i don't know what changes they can really try to make but if you're edmonton you need to try your best this offseason i know it's gonna be difficult with the expansion draft and everything everything else going on you didn't really get to scout guys this year like you normally would because of pandemic but they got to do something because this well, can't forget this... don't forget dry sidles not too much you know older than mcdavid right i mean mcdavid's our age dry Sidle, i think was born a couple years before McDavid. So these are two young guys, right? Dry Saddle's 25, McDavid's 24, which is, you know, crazy to think because that's our age as well, or it will be my age in a couple months. But you have two of the best top five players in the league, both on 25 or under. You got to go out and spend money, in my opinion, right? I, I it, Hockey's weird because you don't always see these big, you know, free agent splashes that you see, like how the Patriots did in the NFL, just spend a bunch of money. You've seen, you know, the Nets do it at the NBA side, you know, 
baseball teams like the Yankees or the Dodgers. Dodgers are probably the better example now. Just go spend money. Just go. I, I have. I understand your money's locked up in these two young guys, but just build a team around them. I right? because clearly you can't develop talent, so just go out and get guys to put around them. You develop those two guys. I want to be put that clear, but clearly you're not hitting on all your draft picks. So go out, spend some money, get some dudes, make some trades. But yeah, the the timing of the expansion draft certainly doesn't help their cause either. Yeah, I do want to give credit to the Jets. This turned into a lot of Oilers talk, which I think is deserved just because of who, you know, the storyline surrounding them, but I do want to make it clear that the Jets have built a really good team. You have Kyle Connor, Mark Scheifele, uh, they traded for Pierre-Luc Dubois, which is, I think that's something that people aren't talking about either. They traded Patrick Laine away for Pierre-Luc Dubois, uh, and it seems like that's... I know Dubois on the stat sheet hasn't really impressed, but you have Paul Stasny. I mentioned Nikolai Ehlers, one of the most exciting young players in hockey. Blake Wheeler is still there. Connor Hellebuck, uh, Josh Morrissey. So, like, they have good talent there. Uh, we'll see what happens with this Toronto-Montreal series. I think Winnipeg is going to be really competitive no matter who they play. They're going to get some time off, which, I, I mean, it could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. They were firing on all cylinders, but... You have Toronto Montreal game five or game four is tonight. And game five is tomorrow. So the series could be over tomorrow if Maple Leafs win these next two games. But Montreal could drag this out a little bit. People uh, forget that Montreal won game one. Toronto, you know, I, if I had to guess, I think Toronto's going to hit them with a gentleman's sweep. I just think Toronto is one of the most talented teams on paper, too, just right behind Colorado. I'd be shocked if Montreal won another game in this series. I think it's cool what Montreal's been able to accomplish this year. But I'd be very surprised if the Canadians win another game in this series. Well, Montreal made some noise in the bubble last year as well. Um, I Toronto, if there's any year you're going to get one of your biggest markets in the league deep into the playoffs, it's going to be this year. We talked about how the Hurricanes are happy they don't have to play the Bruins. Toronto's right up there with them as well team that loses in six or seven every single year in the first round to Boston because of the way the playoffs are formatted. I've talked about it before. I think the way the NHL does their playoff formatting just doesn't make sense to me. It, it, you're Especially when you have a lot of your better teams in, in one or two divisions. Makes it really, it, excluding this year, obviously, the previous years they've done it. It makes it really difficult for other teams to win and make it deep. Um, Toronto... This could be the the year. Obviously, Tavares got kind of at, like wiped out, uh, I think, in game one. Um, I don't know if he's going to come back. I, I know he's at, le- at least two weeks, I think, Ryan, because of the knee. But he had a knee and a concussion or something on that one play. But, yeah, Toronto, if there's any year they're going to make it deep, it's this year. I'm ex- you know, it's... Of course, the Canadian team not winning the cup for as long as it's been. It, it, of course, it would be kind of neat to see uh, the fact that there's no fans there in Canada. I think that would kind of be the one upsetting thing, the fact that one of these teams might finally win a cup and then there's not going to be anybody there to see it. I had heard on part of my take, Paul Bissonnette was talking about it, that one of the Canadian teams might relocate temporarily to somewhere in the United States as a hub city, Um by the time the conference finals roll around, which I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. But, I mean, we know how Canada feels about teams traveling up there and then traveling back. So yeah, it might have to be what they do unless the, the the guidelines change. But that'll be neat to follow. We'll move to the eastern side of things. Your Bruins, gentlemen, sweep. Capitals won game one. People thought, ah, uh, maybe the Caps can make another run. And then the Bruins put out that fire very quickly, very efficiently. So how are you feeling? Can they make a run, or are you still not going to get your hopes up? Yeah, so the Capitals stink. Uh, Really happy that the Bruins uh, took care of business. They didn't play very well in Game 1 or Game 2, I will admit that. But after that, they looked like the Bruins, that ended the regular season strong, really since the trade deadline and getting Taylor Hall. Um, Yeah, I... Listen, I just don't want to play the Lightning eventually. If I can avoid that, I think I'll be good. You know, you got the Islanders, not really afraid of them. Pittsburgh played us tough this year, but 
I think we could beat the Penguins too. There's a lot of talent there uh, for, for Boston. I was really nervous, Ryan, this whole series that Tom Wilson was going to try and murder somebody on the team. Uh, we made it through, right? That anytime you play the Capitals, you got to worry that Tom Wilson is going to take out one of your best players for the rest of the season. We made it through. So that's, I think, what I'm most happy about. Tuka Rask was able to redeem himself with the most polarizing, you know, stance in all of Boston sports of how he plays in the playoffs and how the fan base reacts. Now the fan base loves him. Uh, so, yeah, good times for the Bruins, which is nice because, you know, we'll have at least one team in Boston make a deep run. As you alluded to, they will play the Penguins or the Islanders. The series has gone back and forth. Islanders won game one. Pittsburgh won the next two. Islanders have won the next two. And now we're at game six, which is tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., which is very, it's, uh, listen, I, I advocated for earlier start times, so I'm glad at least one league is experimenting with it. Uh, I think I think this goes seven. Uh, as a Flyers fan, I'm I'm certainly not rooting for the Penguins, but I I just I feel like this is a series that when it started I thought had the potential to go seven, and I still think that's the ultimate goal. I think that Pittsburgh wins on the road here. I mean, both of these teams they have so much talent uh, throughout all levels. Uh, of course, Pittsburgh Ron Hextall is overseeing things now, which is. It's bittersweet. I always want to see him succeed out with Pittsburgh, but I'll give credit to the Islanders. They they went down two games to one. People kind of wondered, ah, you know, they, they don't have the momentum, but they battled back, and now they, they have a chance to make another run. I said last week, listen, if the Islanders can make a run and make it to the, you know, the conference finals, I'll put that in quotation marks. I guess it's not really conference finals anymore. That would be good for hockey. Just get some different teams in there. Uh, if the Islanders can make it to the finals, I think the Islanders and the Avalanche would be really neat. I, and I, I think that would be good for the league too. The, you know, the Islanders used to be really good too back in the day. So like a finals matchup like that, I think would be pretty cool. Yeah. But Ryan, you're forgetting about the Boston Bruins though. Uh, just, no, no, I'm not forgetting. I just, you're, you're I, forgetting I, I'm forgetting about the Bruins. I'm uh, extending but, an olive branch because I, I want to make oh. it clear that I'm not overly biased against somebody's favorite hockey team that they've been a fan of forever. So I just want to make it clear that I can see these things from a non-biased perspective. The Islanders are a good hockey team. They're fun to watch. And they could theoretically make a run. They're one of the teams that I think could make a run. So I just needed to put that out there. Yeah, so, you know, someone's favorite team he was criticizing. uh, I think it was Varlamov who had that really bad game last week. We give up like five goals. Um, You know, you look at the, the Islanders roster and they have a lot of goalies and I have to make sure because I'm in soccer mode right now goalies not goalkeepers uh so I got to get my my terminology right here um they have a lot of goalkeep goalkeepers goalies on the roster um and Varlamov you know I think he was the one that had some kind of off the field or off the field off the really bad segment for me right now Ryan really you know interesting or bad off the ice stuff when he was in Colorado I think it was Varlamov right so he's yes. trying to restart his career. Um, Sorokin has been the, the better of the two in the playoffs. You know, just looking at their roster, Corey Schneider is apparently on there. Um, so good for him, I guess. But, yeah, Glenn, not a fan of Varlamov. Um, I was kind of surprised that he was still starting somewhere. But, hey, good for him. Yeah, Sorokin, I think, should be starting more. I think he's a lot better. It's just it's it's funny because you look at these teams on paper. The, the Penguins, of course, are really top heavy with Crosby, Gensel, and Malkin. Uh, the goalies are a bit of an issue there. Defense is a bit of an issue. You look at the Islanders; they have, I think, the goaltending. They probably have the edge. But it, you look at some of the names, you're like, ah, oh, wow, this team's really you know exceeding. With I mean, Barzell is obviously very good. Yeah, Brock Nelson, uh, Gabriel Pajo is is really good. I think it's. I, you know, it's, I, I made my point about the Islanders, so I hope we can just kind of quell the notion that I don't want them to, you know, as a Flyers fan, I'd much prefer the Flyers to be the best team in the division, but it's, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm not, it's not like I'm actively rooting for one of these teams to make the finals, but I think from a hockey perspective, the Islanders being in the finals could be neat. Bruins could be too, you know, we'll see. Um, 
the teams that they would play uh, on this side of the bracket, we'll start with Carolina and Nashville. I'll give credit to Nashville. I wrote them off. I said, eh, they're probably going to be just happy to be there. I don't think they're going to really give Carolina too much trouble. And they proved me wrong by winning two consecutive double overtime games on Friday and Sunday. So now game five is tonight. I still think Carolina wins in six, but I'll give Nashville a lot of credit. I really didn't think they had what it take what it took to make this a series, but they've they've made it competitive. So I'll give them a lot of credit. Well, if Nashville wins tonight, Ryan, I think they win the series. Um, I think in a game five like this, with Nashville having all the momentum. It's going to be really tough on Carolina if they lose a game at home. Uh, This might be a a series where everyone wins at home, right? We've seen that before in hockey, basketball, baseball. You know, it it might be this series. Everyone wins at home, but if Nashville could steal a game on the road here. This is, by the way, the sellout series, right? You know, you got big crowds, both of these arenas, most in, I think, the NHL right now in terms of just having fans in the stands. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for a Stanley Cup playoff atmosphere, this is probably the series to go to right off the bat. Yeah, I I agree. I talked up Carolina a lot, so um, oops. But uh, they're still a very talented team. As I said, I'm I'm not worried, not worried at all. Still think they win the series, but this is yeah definitely game five is tonight. As we as we uh, said. Watch this series. It's been a lot of fun. The fans being there, as you alluded to, um, I think that's been a big factor too. Just you know, seeing the full arenas uh, with these, both of these teams have rabid fan bases, so uh, that's that's kind of been exciting. They're going to play the winner of the Florida series, the Panthers and the Lightning. Tampa Bay won the first two games. Florida's battled back. They've won two out of the last three, so they have Game Six tomorrow. Florida uh, still down three to two, so they got to win to make the series go seven. Uh, it's tough for me to, I mean, Spencer Knight looked really, really good in his playoff debut. I think it's kind of funny that Bobrovsky was, uh, he wasn't even the backup. He was a $10 million guy just sitting in the suite, the press box. Um, so I don't know how Florida's going to handle that. Spencer Knight's their goalie of the future. He has been since they drafted him, which is why I don't know why they gave Bobrovsky the contract that they did. But regardless, uh, I'm excited to see if they go back to Spencer. You almost, I think, have to go back to Spencer Knight for Game 6 just based on how well he played on Monday. And I think the kid could get it done. I've been a big Spencer Knight guy since they drafted him, and I th- I think that he could make it go 7. I, that, that would be really exciting and really intriguing if that's what ends up happening. Yeah, well, I really want Tampa Bay to lose. Uh, I just I can't stand it. They're too good, and they own the Bruins every year in the playoffs, so I need them to lose. Yeah, Bobrovsky, not a good look, not a good PR look by Bobrovsky. Uh, did not have a great series, gave up 10 goals in three games. Uh, not great. Uh, I think they're the only team to use three goalies in the playoffs so far. Um, but hey, you know, you go with the younger guy. Bobrovsky's kind of been this really weird figure to follow around in hockey. Right, Ryan? Because, I mean... He had all these expectations when he was in Philly. Then he goes to Columbus, has a couple really good playoff years, right? Um, gets, he's in the consideration uh, for the Vezina all the time. And here he is in Florida just making money and sitting in the suite. So his career, for any of those who want to go and kind of follow along, is quite interesting, in my opinion. He has a no movement clause too for the next couple seasons. Uh, it's modif- There's a modified no trade clause. Uh, his the final two seasons of that contract. I don't. I don't know why it, because they drafted Spencer Knight before free agency would have started that season. So I really don't get what they were trying to accomplish by doing this. I don't know how they're going to get themselves out of this Bobrovsky deal. Uh, I'm very excited to see how they're able to manage it. But yeah, Spencer Knight. He's going to be very good. I just want to get that out there. I'm not the first person to say that, but he's going to be a good guy for them for, for the long haul. It's just they're going to have to figure out how to get off of Bobrovsky's contract. But that was that's that's hockey. I think that's the most we've talked about hockey since we started this podcast back in August, August 17th, 16th, one of those days. And we're going to talk about it more next week when the some of the second-round matchups will be underway. So that'll be fun. 
Um, we'll, we'll, we'll mention briefly, I, I don't want to talk too much about the NBA because the most of these series just started and the games are kind of spaced out, so there's not too much to talk about, really. Um, I will say my Sixers are up one game to nothing, so good start for us. 15 more wins and we're, we're champions. Uh, your team made it close for a half, and then they kind of stumbled there, which was to be expected probably without one of your best players. So can they steal a game at all, or is it going to be a sweep? They might win a game. Uh, I, I think the bigger thing with the NBA playoffs this year um, is what we could potentially be set up for in the second and third rounds, right? I mean, you look at especially the Eastern Conference, uh, getting a second round matchup of like the Sixers and the Knicks or the Hawks, and then you get Nets, Bucks, maybe or Nets Heat. I mean, we could be set up for a really entertaining second round. Um, and then the Western Conference is going to have a lot of good series all throughout, regardless. Um, Ryan, congrats on your Sixers! Big first step for you. Uh, I know Glenn was putting the pressure on for you about trying to get to the second round to have a playoff Glenn matchup against his Knicks. Um, I just want to say how great it is to have basketball back, playoff basketball back at the Garden. You know, regardless of if it was a loss or not, it's really cool, in my opinion. As just a basketball guy, it's really fun to see. And and I woke up on Sunday, I sent in the group chat, you know, the, the 94 Knicks theme song or whatever year it was, you know, the Go New York Go. I was amped, and I'm not even a Knicks fan. So, really cool to see. Uh, playoff basketball back at the Mecca. Yeah, when the garden's full for playoff basketball, it's a neat atmosphere, especially when a player on the other team hits a dagger and then tries to shush the entire crowd. That's also really cool to watch, too. Uh, you mentioned Glenn tried to put some pressure on my Sixers. I think he needs to worry about his own team getting out of this series first before trying to come at the one seed. But that's that. not going any further. You know, we're good. We're fine. I think it was kind of actually pretty funny. One of the things that I wanted to bring up was how everybody was saying, oh, the playing tournament's so stupid because now Stephen Curry is not in the playoffs. Now we have to watch the Grizzlies go up against the Jazz. Well, look who won game one. It was the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I, I don't know if Golden State would have done the same thing or not, but I think it was really cool to see Memphis put together. I mean, they, they almost lost it there at the end, but still it's – I think this is what really intrigued people. Like, you look at all these different matchups. Utah is likely going to win this series. I'd say there's a very good chance they win the next four games. But a lot of these series, they're really up for grabs. Like, I think this is the first time in a while when you look at both conferences, you're like, you know, I could see this team make it a run, this team, that team. It's it's really intriguing all throughout. Yes, I think the playing tournament this year was a success. Uh, I think, you know, Everyone going into it, we didn't really know what to expect uh, just because it, it's a unique concept um, in terms of the way most playoff structures we have in, in, you know, American pro sports are. It's kind of something we haven't seen to that structure. Got a couple good games in there. You know, listen, it, it's it's comparable. And I, I mentioned this when we did March Madness, Ryan. You know, I always, what did I always say? Watch out for a play-in team, right? From the first four. Watch out for one of those teams in the first four and make a run. UCLA won a couple, or went obviously to the final four. Syracuse won a couple games. They could turn into the same thing here. I mean, to, to build some momentum under playoff intensity or in the NCAA case, tournament intensity. It, it, it does wonders, right? And it, and you could even turn that into like, I don't know if you can make that case for wildcard teams in baseball just yet, just because it's a one game playoff. But when you look at that similarity, uh, I wasn't really surprised in many ways that Memphis was able to win just because they have that momentum and, and that experience with a young team. By the way, Ryan, most of their rotation is our age. So they're not going anywhere uh, for a very long time. Um, again, so a lot of those guys are actually younger than us too, which puts it even more into perspective how old we are getting. Um, but yeah, Utah is a good team, as you said. There's so many good teams, I think, especially in the Western Conference this year. So, you know, I talked about 
there's only certain games for playoff hockey that are worth staying up really late for. I think on the NBA side, all four matchups, if, you, if you're staying up to one in the morning, I think you're going to get a pretty solid game. We'll talk about the NBA a little more next week, but there are a couple more things I wanted to talk about with the NBA. There's well, I guess, really just one thing, I guess. There are two series right now that have played two games. One of them in the Western Conference uh, was the Nuggets and the Blazers. The Portland had won game one pretty easily. Denver came back last night. They won game two pretty easily. So what do you buy into more? Do you buy more into game one or do you buy more into game two? I, I think whoever is whoever wins more than one game in a row is going to... Because these two teams, if you remember, I think they played the seven games a couple of years ago in the last playoffs before pre-COVID, right? So 2019, I think they went seven games. Um, this series is a lot more evenly matched than I think a lot of people think. Um, it's a shame that we don't have Jamal Murray, Ryan... Uh, Really sucks because that would have really added a whole nother dimension to this this matchup. I'm a big mellow guy. I'm a big Willard guy. McCollum. I I, I love the Blazers. I, I think Terry Stotts doesn't. He he gets a lot of criticism. I think uh, and, and you know, obviously it's going to be tough to get a top seed and consistently win and make it deep in the Western Conference, but. I think Terry Stotts is is a, a pretty good to decent head coach, in my opinion. Um, it's just he has to deal with LeBron now on top of Kawhi. Everyone moved out west, right? So I don't know. It'll be that. I think that series might go seven games. It might. I mean, there's a two again. Not having Jamal Murray though really kind of sucks because I don't know. It, it would. It's a big what if with the Nuggets if they had him. I will say I think the Nuggets made good adjustments in Game 2. Game 1 seemed like they struggled uh, defensively in general, but I thought really in the pick and roll, I thought Jokic kind of got exposed. I thought Game 2 they did a better job of that. Uh, despite the fact that Lillard went off, they they were still able to, to win the game. Um, I, As a Day 1 Nuggets fan, it's hard for me to pick against them, but I agree. I think this series could go the distance. It's just they are, they are evenly matched. Uh, I think that I would be surprised if it doesn't go seven at this point. Well, I think game two showed how great of a coach Michael Malone is. Not Mike Malone, Michael Malone. Um, and, and, and listen, I know this is stupid. But like when you see like those people doing rankings on like, you know, TikTok or Instagram or YouTube, there is so much Michael Malone disrespect out there, mainly because people don't know who he is. But he is a great coach. Um, you know, I talked about Terry Stotts a minute ago, but Michael Malone has silently or quietly built this Nuggets team into something really, really cool and special and fun, right? I mean, Jokic is such a fun player to watch, and when you pair him with Jamal Murray, it's even more of a crazier duo. Um, but this year might be the year that we finally get some respect on Michael Malone's name a little bit in terms of putting him into you know, the upper echelon of coaches in the league. Um, because again, I, I, I just, I don't know if a lot of people appreciate what he's done there in the relationships he's built with the players and how respected he is. It, Yeah, this might be the year we finally kind of put that narrative to bed. Yeah, he's definitely a really good coach that deserves a lot of credit. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, the game that, the series that's gone two games, Milwaukee and Miami, the bubble rematch, Milwaukee looks pretty good. I was talking to a buddy of mine leading up to the playoffs. He's like, are you scared of the heat? I was like, no, I really, I don't think that they're going to be that big of an issue. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, that's, this ain't the bubble heat. And so far I've been proven correct. I know Milwaukee's just been on fire for the first couple of games in some different facets, but I mean, Jimmy Butler doesn't look the same. Bam looks scared to try to take over offensively. Tyler Hero's obviously not the same. He was in the bubble. It, this is why I said I wasn't scared of the Heat, and why I said I was I'd be worried about the Bucks. I think the Bucks are a very good team, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to the Heat, but I I, I just it, it this year they struggled with COVID. I get that they struggled with some other stuff, but this just did not seem like it was going to be their year. I think the Bucks, you know, they're they're the team I'm most scared of in the East. I'm not scared of Brooklyn as much as I'm scared of the Bucks. I think the Bucks could very realistically make a run to to the finals. 
I think a lot of people um, kind of forget how young Miami is, right? And and I want to preface this by saying, yes, Dwayne Dedmond is on their roster. Yes, Andre Iguodala is on their roster. Um, but in terms of like these young pieces, right, the guys that kind of made a name for themselves last year, Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, Bam Adebayo. I mean, these are all, these are all guys that are on the younger side, Ryan. So like, Yes, they had this deep run last year and were a couple wins away from a championship. They're also still developing, right? And they really didn't have an off season because they finished in October and the next season started up on Christmas. So there wasn't really that development there. So I, I give the Heat a little bit of a pass in terms of just, you know, they need some more time, right? I mean, they're really talented players, but in such a unique situation, it's going to take a little bit of time to take that next step in the development. Milwaukee, I kind of flip-flop on from time to time. Um, they're sneaky deep, um, sneaky deep in their rotation. Um, it, it's kind of cool to see, you know, some of these guys that were pretty solid on other teams or maybe sometimes didn't work out. They come to Milwaukee and they're having, you know, a pretty solid go at it. Like Brent Forbes, right, a guy who, who came off the bench for Greg Popovich, in San Antonio, Bobby Portis, who, who's kind of been around a little bit, he he gets some nice backup minutes there. Um, I think it shows the impact that Drew Holiday has on a team. Ryan, former Sixer, uh, I would hope I don't remember. Uh, I would hope that Sixers fans really appreciated what he did. He's a really, really, really good player. Uh, and Milwaukee really kind of jumped through hoops, no pun intended, to go get him and. It's, I think it shows the impact of the holiday because they didn't have him last year, and he's a really, really good player. Yeah, we'll talk about the NBA more next week. Some of these series will uh, probably be over. Some of them will be close to being over. It's a weird thing about the playoffs this year. I mean, some of these series might go as late as, like, June 5th, June 6th. Like, we're normally getting ready for the finals at that point, but... It's only going to be the second round, so it'll, it'll kind of be cool in that regard for these things to go on a little longer. Um to to end the show, I want to just get our Motorsports Minute, um, as is tradition. F1 was at Monaco. That was, you know, their their kind of premier location. Maybe not in terms of you know, the, the racing action, but as a Red Bull racing fan, it was nice to see Verstappen get the W. Uh, Checo, Sergio Perez finished fourth, which was nice. Uh, Mercedes just did not have a lot of luck, uh, unfortunately. Uh, Valtteri Bottas or Botas tried to pit. They could not get the one of the tires off, uh, which was unfortunate. I think it was the right front. They just they shredded it and it just they could not get it off. So he had to retire. Lewis Hamilton qualified seventh. He couldn't really get up there. That's one. Of, that's that's why people kind of say the race at Monaco is qualifying and not the actual race because it's just it's almost impossible to overtake. So even still, I thought there were some interesting things about Monaco, but I'm happy to get past that and get on to the, the rest of the schedule. So I'm happy for Verstappen leading the World Drivers' Championship for the first time ever, uh, which is cool. So I hope that Red Bull can continue that momentum moving forward. I hope Sergio can continue this momentum and help Verstappen make a run at the title championship. Uh, NASCAR, they were at Circuit of the Americas in Austin for the first time ever. They used the rain tires. Uh it was pretty dangerous. I don't. I hope that this doesn't dissuade them from racing in the rain again, but they need to try to do something to prevent the water from spraying up because the visibility was very, very poor. There were some pretty scary incidents. Uh, we're lucky that nobody got hurt. Uh, they did end up calling the race. Chase Elliott got his first win of the season, the defending champion. But they need to figure out a way to make the water not spray up and prevent these cars from seeing where they're going. They had a red flashing light on the back, but that's not nearly enough. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I hope they come back to circuit of the Americas next year. I think that it was great. It was kind of neat to see all three series race there this weekend. And yeah, so this weekend, of course, is the Coca-Cola 600 for NASCAR. Um, one of their biggest races, one, I mean, their longest race of the season, um, Memorial day weekend, as always, uh, F1 is off their next race. I want to say is the sixth. Yeah, it's the sixth. They're going to be in Azerbaijan, uh, the Baku City Circuit. So that'll be kind of cool. But yeah, that was your. Uh, had to get my motorsports minute in there, as always. Yeah. So uh, multiple things here. I do have a pops my tarts to end the show. Um, so mm. don't let me forget to circle back to that. Um, but 
Monaco, Ryan, um, I am familiar with that because it is featured in Iron Man 2. Hmm. Tony Stark goes there. Uh, I'm not going to spoil what happens, but Tony Stark ends up fighting a villain there. Uh, Tony Stark, for, for those who don't know, is Iron Man. I don't know if you remember from the couple movies you got to see with us at school. But uh, yeah, so there's a, an enticement, Ryan, for you to watch the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Monaco is featured in Iron Man 2. It's really cool to see. I mean, like it's a street circuit. Like they race throughout the city, um, which is which is really kind of neat. There's a YouTube video that I watched that was like five minutes long. It shows how they do it every year. Like they repave a certain part of the road. They just they bring all these cranes and stuff in to like put all this stuff together. Like it's all really cool how they do it. Um, but y- yeah, maybe maybe I will. Uh, whenever I get around to watching that, uh, I might make the connection. Well, you're still. You're still barely through Star Wars, which yes. we're really we you need to start picking up the pace a little bit here. Uh Glenn is getting very impatient about your your pacing with Star Wars. Maybe that's why it pops his tarts. We we're gonna have to ask him. Maybe uh I'm not watching it because it is popping his tarts, and then it'll get his you know, his mind won't be one hundred percent on the mini golf match. Because he just can't believe that I've watched, have watched Star Wars in a month. So, maybe it's a tactical decision. Yeah, well, I think he made a, a, a tactical decision to postpone it a couple more weeks to get in your head even more. Mini golf won't take place for at least another month, it looks like, or, or at least three weeks. Um, we'll get there eventually. Maybe that's his way of getting in your head, rattling you a little bit. Uh, but I do want to end on a Pops My Tarts. I don't know if you have one. Mine is pollen. I hate pollen. As someone who is allergic to it, I hate it. Comes, I my white car is now yellow, and whenever I go to open the door, I get it all over my hands. And what am I supposed to do with my hand? I can't go back in the house to wash my hand because then I'm just going to touch the same door handle again when I'm out. So yeah, what pops my tarts is pollen. I. You got to wash. I will say, like, I don't like it from the perspective of the car, too, just because I wash it on Thursday afternoon at like 4 p.m. And then the next day it was it just it was all covered again. It's just, well, why even wash the car? But you got to keep doing it. I might have to go out there today or tomorrow and get it washed again because it's starting to starting to accumulate a little bit. But yeah, this is a rough time of year, um, but we just have to power through it and eventually we won't have to worry about it. Um some good weather this week. Last week we got some last week and especially we got temperatures like in the nineties. That that that's what pops my tarts, actually. It's it's nothing that we can change, but when it's like ninety degrees in the middle of May is what I have a problem with. Like I don't want to see ninety on my forecast app until June at the earliest. If it's happening in May, that's it's a little it's like when there's like a when it's like I don't know. I, I want to say like when it's 70 degrees in like the first week of March, like I have a little bit of an issue with that. 90 degrees in May is just a little too much for me. I'm all right with it. I don't even bother washing the car, by the way, Ryan. I just let the rain take care of it. No, like why, what? Why put in all the time and effort or even to take it to a car wash? Why bother either method when you're just... When it's just going to get pollen on it again in 12 hours. Why bother? Why waste the time? Uh, yeah. Hit it Are, with the wiper fluid a little bit, get it off the windshield, and then... So you're you the type of person through. that, why make your bed if you're just going to go into it at night? Is that is exactly. that also you? Okay. You, yeah. you lived in the same house that I did. I mean, I would just, you know, make it look semi-nice, but why bother if I'm going to get into the bed in 12 hours, right? I mean... It's just, you got to take that time and push it into something else, right? That's just, that's just how I look at things. Um, Looks like you're writing something down there. I am writing down everything we talked about. That way I can remember to go back and find it um, when I find the timestamps. But yeah, that's okay. So that was episode 42, ever so slowly getting to 50, um, which is crazy number um almost coming up on a year a couple more months we're at a year of this a few more months i guess so maybe we're still kind of far away but i want to thank you all for listening the next time we record will be because we're not going to record on memorial day so um 
next time we record will be June, which will be neat. Um, no, Ryan, I expected us to record during the Coca-Cola 600 at your, your whatever your Memorial Day barbecue is with your grilled chicken. I expected us to record during that. <laughs> no? That's at... What is your Memorial Day go-to food at a barbecue? I know you're a grilled chicken guy. Or I know you mentioned other stuff, too. What is your Memorial Day barbecue spread look like i'll i'll not just say you know protein what's your spread looking like i think i think it's all just dependent on how you're feeling that day uh you know maybe you change it up a little bit but yeah you gotta gotta go with the chicken chicken's a great great one chicken thigh is better uh i think chicken breast is overrated chicken thigh is really where it's at that's the best type of chicken i agree especially if you can put it on the grill um but yeah it's yep I mean, you know, like what I, sides I, you, you're working with? Are you like you go with like a potato <laughs> salad, like, or just a regular salad, or like chips or fries or? It, it's all dependent. It's all dependent on the weather and the atmosphere. It, it's just it's all dependent on a, a bunch of different variables. Um, we could talk about that next week um, on June first. That'll be a good way to open the show, talking about food. Uh, for Memorial eat. Day. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a good segment to start with. Um, I don't want this to drag out any longer and take up any more of your time. So I want to thank you all for listening to this episode. We'll catch you guys again next time.